To everyone tuned in from around the globe, good day. My name is Vignesh and welcome to the Head Foundation's Educational Leadership in a Crisis webinar series. The Head Foundation is a charitable organization based in Singapore and committed to the sustainable development of Asia in general and Southeast Asia in particular. We support meaningful research, capacity, and capability building initiatives that are innovative, sustainable, scalable, and impactful in the fields of healthcare and education. In this three-part educational leadership in a crisis series, exemplary school leaders from the Philippines and Indonesia, graduates of the Head Foundation and University of Queensland's Certificate in Educational Studies in Leadership course, show how they have led school and system-wide responses to school closures brought on by the COVID-19 lockdowns. These leaders will be joined by eminent educational leadership scholars who will discuss how we can adapt, contextualize, and apply these strategies in our own settings. This practice focus series aims to share best practices and relevant, actionable strategies with you, our esteemed audience. Today, we kick off the series with our first session, Mobilizing Your Community. We often hear it said that it takes a village to raise a child. The way in which the COVID pandemic has impacted how students continue to learn despite the unexpected disruptions has truly demonstrated the wisdom of this ancient saying. In today's session, we explore how school leaders, as figureheads of their school and communities, have worked with parents and the wider community to create holistic learning environments in these uncertain times. Those who are tuned in on our Facebook live feed are invited to post their questions in the comment section of the Facebook live video, and those questions will be shared with our panelists in the Zoom platform. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce the series moderator, Associate Professor Vicente Reyes, Jr. from the University of Nottingham. Vicente, please. A leader is like a shepherd. He stays behind the flock, letting the most nimble go out ahead whereupon the others follow, not realizing that all along they are being directed from behind. These are words from Nelson Mandela. And I think now in the pandemic that all of us face, his words about leadership resonate with all of us. I welcome you to our first of a series of three webinars in which we focus about educational leadership in times of crisis. This webinar is really a conversation and we are very lucky to have with us three distinguished colleagues who will lead our conversation. We encourage you to participate through the chat questions and later on during the Q&A to share with us what your comments and suggestions and questions are. The panelists for our session today are made up of two practitioners, one from the Philippines and another from Indonesia. And the third one is a critical friend, an academic who has had years of teaching experience as well in Singapore. Let me introduce who our panelists are. We have Mr. Sofiandi Effendi, who is currently a senior high principal at Budi Luhur School in Indonesia. Andy has been a principal for many years in primary schools and is now currently in a senior high school. He was awarded one of the best school principals in the region of Tenggara and Selatan region of Indonesia. He is one of our practitioner participants for our session today. We also have, as I mentioned a while ago, an academic, Associate Professor Hyron Sale, who is the Assistant Dean of Higher Degrees by Coursework at the National Institute of Education in Singapore. Our third panelist is Dr. Orlando Pozen. 
He is the school's division superintendent in the province of Tarlac. He manages 428 elementary schools, 74 junior high schools, 69 senior high schools, and about 10,000 teaching staff. So he has a lot of experience in relation to leading people. These are the panelists who will be having a conversation with all of us as we proceed with the first set of our webinar series today. I just wanted to greet our friends from Indonesia, from Singapore, from Manila, the Philippines, and also our friends from Australia, Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom. It seems that we have a very global international audience for our webinar today. We now move on with our first presenter. I would like to call on uh, Dr. Ronaldo Pozen to share with us his insights, the lessons that he has learned and that he wishes to impart to all of us with the idea of obtaining feedback, suggestions in relation to educational leadership in a crisis. Let me call on Dr. Ronaldo Pozen. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Paulson, the Superintendent of Dep in Tarlac Province in the Philippines, and I'm here with you to share my experiences in mobilizing our community in our province. So this is it. In Dep Ed or Department of Education, Tarlac Province, we have our three R's that we use in rising above this pandemic that the whole world has for us. In the midst of all these things, it is a must that education must go. So in order for us to go on, we have the following things in our mind. How do we continue our formal education in this midst of this problem? And uh, what modalities shall we employ in order to deliver formal education to our learners? And number three, what resources do we need to ensure the success of our uh, reaching out the learners? So in order to address the following, we have the following obstacles in carrying out all these things. And of course, if we have the problem, we have the solutions. You see, it's a rainy season time in the Philippines, Typhoon Dukan. We have our earthquakes also, and we have this pandemic. So in order to address these things, we are institutionalizing our health and safety protocols in the school levels. Another problems that we had, we have to develop technology for the integration of instruction in our learners. So in order to address that, we in the Department of Education with our government, we have to provide technology for e-learning to support our students. We have to do it because we don't do face-to-face -face now. There is also a problem that data says most of our learners now prefer to have modular learning. So in order to address that, we have to train our instructional leaders to design and prepare instructional materials for remote teaching and of course, for home-based learning. To solve this, we have to set up e-learning training teams in the school, in the districts, and of course, in the division level, and train all our teachers with regards to the critical and the most essential learning competence the students need. Then there is also the problem of uh, internet connectivity. There is limited access to some of our students. They lack some ICT gadgets and uh, on the part of the learner, especially those in the power flung areas. So to solve that, we were able to create or install radio stations in schools. We develop apps. And of course, we use some modules to address this problem. Our synthesis as regards this matter to address our problem, we employ this trimodal mode of learning modality in our place. So for those with gadgets, they have their internet connectivity, we use the digital online modality of learning. For those who do not have uh, connectivity, but they have their gadget, we use the digital offline mode of learning and for those who do not have the gadget at the same time, they do not have the connectivity, we have our printed materials, which we develop in order to give to the students. So whichever modality you're going to use, you will always have the same competences in all this learning. So there will be no loss of uh, skills to be learned and developed in our learners. 
These are the lessons that we learned in our experience in mobilizing our people. So it is very important that we have to involve our teachers. You see, this the innovative, innovative material and uh, technology was developed by a teacher in a very small school. So he was able to come up with radio station that would cater to all the, the students and the schools in their area. So even without uh, any internet connectivity, learning can go on using this uh, radio station which a school was able to develop. We learned that we have to involve our teachers because their innovativeness will always come out in this kind of pandemic. We also work as a team and we engage our local uh, leaders. Uh, the man you see there is a mayor in one of the towns and he was able to provide television sets, uh, printers, laptop and other school to use it. So our leaders, political leaders, are very important in this matter. So we engage them to the maximum level that we can possibly do because they have the resources that we do not have ours in our schools. So they are very important in our, in our rising above this pandemic. We also engage our parents because uh, with the parents now having their children at home, uh, they are there to assess the learners. So before doing this, we also train and capacitate our parents in order for them to know their roles and duties when the opening of classes comes October 5. So in this, we had our dry run, we have our dry out, and you would see the successful engagement of these parents in, assess, in assisting their children in this kind of uh, learning in this midst of this uh, global pandemic. So together we can do it. Uh, from the top management down to our teachers, to our stakeholders, this includes from, from my office down to the teachers, the principals and, this, and the supervisors, we include them in the planning. We engage our partners. Uh, if you see the lady speaking, she is our governor and I am with her team in creating the apps that we will install in the whole province so that all the learners will have an access. So we need to strengthen our linkages and networking with our local government. And lastly, even the smallest unit in our local government, the barangay, are engaged. In this, uh, in this picture, you would see the officials they lend to us their vehicles, and these vehicles are used in delivering or carrying out the various learning modules that we develop to the far-flung areas. We have a drop-by station in every barangay. We put there our materials, then they will be the one to distribute and retrieve it to the parents. So together, we can do it. Uh, you know, we have to trust one another we do when all these things fails we have one common word that we follow in our division Tarlac province we are trusting our principals because if you are going to trust our school heads you are in good hands and of course we trust very much our teachers because you will be and we will be in our best hand when everything fails when all our preparation fails the teachers will be our saving grace but together we can do it. We can rise above this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Orlando Pozan, for um, sharing with us the important lessons that you have encountered as you confront the pandemic. Um, uh, I like the idea of uh, involving teachers, making sure that uh, you foster the initiative, partnering up with local chief executives, uh, the mayor, the governor, and then engaging with parents. These are really practical tips that all of us can look into as we try to deal with the pandemic. I just wanted to mention that there are about 600 participants who are signed up and who are participating in our webinar today. And I encourage everyone, if you have any questions, to just type it in the question function of Zoom, and we're going to be reading it out as we go through the session. 
I also wanted to remind you that there's a poll ongoing and I invite you to participate in the poll to find out what the responses would be at the end of the webinar. I would now like to open up our Q&A and I'd like to invite our critical friend, Associate Professor Hyron Salet, to start the ball rolling. I'd like him to ask a couple of questions, perhaps, uh, directed at Ronaldo Pozen. Professor Hyron, please. Right, uh, first and foremost, thank you for having me, uh, Vigente. And also, uh, thank you also for the the participants, I'm, I'm so uh, encouraged to hear there's a lot of people hearing us. Okay, my name is Hyron. I'm from the National Institute of Education. Um, okay, you know, when I was listening to Dr. Paulson sharing, I think I'm really, really impressed actually with uh, what has taken place. Uh, one thought that came to me is really about this COVID-19 pandemic. It's sort of like put every one of us into a kind of system, systemic reform, you know, and you cannot change just one part of our, uh, of one part of our system and all that, but it's like we need to change it at a system level. So that's one thing that uh, crossed my mind as you were sharing, uh, sharing that. And of course, the other thing, the other thing that really uh, crossed my mind is really the enormity of the number of schools, because in Singapore, we only have about 300 over schools. <laughs> but when you look at the Philippines, oh my goodness, it's so big, you know what I mean? And so to do that kind of uh, humongous job, you know, getting everyone on board, wow, that, that's really, really encouraging. You know? So thank you for sharing that, Dr. Paul, uh, Paulson. Yeah? Um, actually, three things came to mind when he was sharing this. One has to do with innovation. Second is technology. And the third one is uh, networks, right? And I think Vicente covered a bit on that idea of networks. When I talk about networks, it's really working together with different, different people in the community, community. So I thought that is really important. But I just want to highlight the idea of innovation. Uh, besides technology, innovation is the idea of uh, thinking of new things, you know, that you have never thought before and really applying it and using it, you know. And uh, the other bit is technology. I'm quite uh, amazed that Actually, actually, when you were sharing this, the first thing, the first thought I had is, don't you have any bandwidth issue? You know, and one of the solution is actually using radio. <laughs> so that was a bit very interesting. Yeah, that was a quick answer to that. I think radio is like old technology, but it is still technology. You know, so that was really encouraging to hear. And um, I just, I just want to ask a question actually to uh, Dr. Pozen, right? Uh, with regard to the networking that you have with parents and with especially teachers, like teachers eventually have to do that kind of, uh, at the end, the kind of uh, e-learning or something like that. So uh, can you tell us more about how do teachers work together to come about, to prepare the materials or to prepare the curriculum that is different than what they used to? How do, you, how do they mobilize each other? Yes, thank you. Uh, if you got my last word, I said that uh, we have to trust our school heads because we're in good hands and we have to trust our teachers because we will be in best hand. How we were able to mobilize them is that we develop or we created teams in the schools who are who are going to do or prepare for all these things. We identified the learning competences, the most essential ones, from there, we develop our modules, we develop our apps, we develop our learning materials to be installed in that app that we develop. We have our open educational resource where we put our, our things there. Then uh, we identify the teachers, the master teachers, and the supervisors who will take charge of every subject area by grade level, kinder teachers up to senior high school grade 12, my subject area, they were there. Then when we were able to identify them, we capacitated them, we give them upskilling of their learning so that they will be well equipped in doing their work. Right, so further to that, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned something about training your teachers, right? Building their capacity and all that. So how was that done? Who provided the training? Is it teachers among themselves? 
uh, yeah, sound we do it at the office because we have our supervisors by subject areas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it's very encouraging to hear also that you said that yes. the principal I was saying different. We have our, yes, yes, they're engaged. Especially our supervisors who are specialists in every subject area. And then the teachers who are major and specializing also in these subject areas, they were pulled together and they were the ones who were trained. Uh, they trained all the other field teachers so that they will come up with all these things that we needed in delivering education in this time. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. I mean, uh, I just passed it on to Vigente a bit. I mean, yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to inform you about the poll that we will be launching or we have launched. The question is very simple. What is the biggest challenge that educational leaders and educators face in engaging with the community? That's actually similar related to the question that was posed by one of our participants. What is the biggest challenge that education leaders and educators face in engaging with the community? So I invite you to kindly participate in this poll. And later on, we'll find out what you think is the biggest challenge that educators face during times of, uh, of crisis, like what we're facing now. We now move on to our next panelist, uh, Sofiandi Effendi. As I mentioned, he is a senior high school principal in Jakarta, Indonesia, and he's going to share with us the experiences that he's had, that he's had and the lessons that he has learned in relation to leadership in a crisis. I pass it on to you, Andy. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vicente. I would like to thank you uh, to Head Foundation for inviting me. So today I'm going to share some of the things that we did in Indonesia, and I'm pretty sure that this is also uh, able to apply in many countries. So mobilizing community, keep moving forward. This is something that we have to do during the pandemic. And we know that the situation is so uncertain that everyone is like and confusing like the theme that we're we're uh, showing up today the educational leadership in the crisis so this one is some of the issues that we are facing off so i'm pretty sure that everybody is uh losing up with the readiness of the online learning and we are not ready for this kind of situation but i'm going to explain in the next slide what, why we are not ready and why some of the school is ready for this kind of situation so uh, the lack of the readiness is also moving to the stress of the students and parents because uh, I was dealing with the primary school for many years and now during the pandemic, uh, students, parents, parents who have stress is more to the lowest level, kindergartens and primary because, uh, because parents are become a teacher. That's going to be a big problem because they're not allowed to go to school and the students themselves. But the students is not really stressful, if I may say that, because now, currently, I'm, I'm doing my, uh, my uh, leader, school leader in the high school. So in high school, it's kind of different. Uh, parents are not really uh, engaged, are not really involving, but the students is really stressful with this kind of situation because in teenagers, they need time to hang out with the friends and everything so and then decreasing of income this is economically this COVID-19 uh, pandemic also is becoming a big issue that some parents are losing jobs and then some parents are also decreasing their income and then this is also reflecting to the school that uh, some schools are losing up uh, the students enrollment and this is also some parents are asking also for the adjustment of admissions and the school also giving up some policy that we are doing. We connect with the teachers. This is the first thing that we do during the, the first months of pandemic on March. We sit down together with the teachers and then we sit down and then we mobilizing everything, teachers and parents and everyone, the stakeholders. Uh, but the first one is the teachers. Why? Because they are the one who connect with the students. And then 
we link with the parents and, and, and students and we give them some, some questionnaires. We give them some feedback and everything. So luckily we have the vocational school, so we collaborate with the vocational school. So this is related with the technology, with the YouTube and uh, social media. So communicate with the board foundation. This is something else that we have to deal with it. We have to co communicate with the board foundation because everything in the end will go to the amount of money. So the obstacles over your faces, I think when we're facing this kind of situation and we are looking for the answer, looking for the solution. So the solution is uh, the human resource. If we have problem with the human resource, we're going to deal it with the, with the we educate them. And we have been using the G Suite for education. So I would like to thank you to Google. All these years we're doing it very good uh, communication and then we applied G Suite for education. And also now we're doing it with uh, YouTube. So we're live, we're making some learning uh, lesson and everything and we upload it to YouTube and also Instagram and some of the activity we're doing it online with the with the uh, Instagram so this one is the key learning points that we are actually uh, learn that in this kind of crisis is actually an opportunity to us as an educators to learn this is our chance to improve our skill this is our chance to see the other side of the world that oh, this is something that's going to be happen five or 10 years in the head. So this kind of crisis is actually opportunity and then open up the mindset of the teachers. So I always say to the teachers and students, this kind of situation is the best situation that we are having right now. So we have to be very grateful for this. So that's why we have to use this kind of uh, situation with the opportunity, many kinds of opportunity, many kinds of change mindset having up and the efficiency also so the efficiency efficiency of time efficiency of working efficiency of anything the human resource and everything is beyond our expectation so this one is the the key learnings that we are facing on now these are the lessons that we are actually learn during the pandemic we actually not focus as a school leaders we usually so many things to do so many things to think and do and decide as soon as possible but but the lesson that we learn the lesson that we learn we have to be focused and we have to be fast respond or well, no matter what it is okay what what seems to be the problem okay we have to talk at it and then sit down and then make a right decision but i know it's not easy but sometimes we have to do it as soon as possible so delegate the task i'm pretty sure i'm sure that all the head leader is actually uh overwhelmed with the job so they have to do this they have to do that but now we have to delegate the task to anyone to the team actually share with the team ask them facilitate with them and then uh ask them to participate and then ask them to involve and engage with this thing so give them opportunity give them a responsibility so those kind of thing we communicate and then we did a lot and then after a few months move, moving on we have something oh, okay i think this is the right place okay the schedule change okay we do the revision we do the evaluation and we involve everything so this is something that we are actually doing it and it's happening right now all the students also engage and then parents all involving so every month every month or every two months we're sending up questionnaire we're sending up questionnaires to the parents and students and asking how are they doing so is there anyone in your family uh, get infected or how is how is the learning process is there anything that we can do so this kind of personal in touch is giving us uh, giving us an opportunity to to do some innovation to do some changes in in a very short time but it's okay but that's what's going on right now because we have to we have to change a lot because because we don't know what's happening to our students but we have to get to know with them closer because we cannot meet them face to face so the the best way is using the video call and then the best way is we're asking them how they do and then we're we're losing up some 
something there's something missing i know and all of us are feeling the same thing so i'm pretty sure if we mobilizing everyone all the stakeholders to involve this is what happened in the school this is what happened at home so we know what happening at at home because we we realize also not every family has uh, a, a great relation with the family so that is why the school is uh, moving on and ask them to involve so i think that's that's the thing that i really want to share the highlights so i put it on the qr code there's a uh, that QR code is actually related to my blog. So there's a short points of explanation there and some pictures also. So I cannot put it here. And thank you very much uh, for giving a chance to share. I'm so really excited to hear some of questions from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, for yes. uh, sharing us with us very practical advice and, and the lessons that you have undergone during this pandemic. I particularly like those three points that you mentioned, um, focus and fast response. I think that's something that all educational practitioners and academics and leaders need to be aware of. And the idea of delegating the task, um, it, this becomes a real challenge during the pandemic uh, because we're not seeing people face to face and we're doing the delegation online through Zoom, through Skype. That really offers a lot of challenges. And then I, the idea of sharing with the team, this is really collaboration and action. So, so thank you for sharing these points. Let me call now on uh, Professor Hiron Saleh again. Uh, by the way, his area of expertise, one of the areas of expertise that Hiron does is professional learning communities. Uh, so this idea of engaging with stakeholders is something that he could really shed a light upon us as we continue our conversation. Hiron, please. All right, thank you, uh, Vicente. Uh, again, after listening to uh, Mr. Sofian, Sofian Lee, uh, I think he himself is a principal, and I think it flows, flows very well with what uh, Dr. Posen mentioned, that the principal make the difference. And the school leader makes a big difference on how uh, schools are run and how schools are run efficiently, and, and especially in response to the COVID-19. And once again, the COVID-19 situation has really created a crisis that requires us to, like what you mentioned, doing things more efficiently, uh, forcing us, compelling us to learn and changing mindsets, <laughs> you know? Yes. Uh, that is something very uh, interesting. I just want to pose a question since you mentioned about mindsets, right? I mean, uh, in, in, uh, in your view, right, what is the main thing, right, to help as a school principal? What is it that you must do as a school principal to help teachers be adaptable? to the current situation or even future situation? Oh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Hiran, for the questions. So this is very interesting questions. Uh, this is something that we do every year. We have the personal development. It means we give them new skills every year. So some teachers, because we know that every school we have almost, we have some teachers who doesn't really accept that, especially with the technology. So mm -hmm. for now, for some teachers who doesn't really interested or who doesn't really into the technology, they have to get into into the technology. <laughs> so that's the biggest that's the biggest uh, what the biggest lesson that I learned. So because it's not happening in my school, I also communicate with many schools. And when I join a workshop and everything, uh, many teachers are excited to learn more technology. For example, how how we do the uh, you know how what should we do for the ice breaking online so this is, this is something that okay we can do it and, and face to face but what about online what should we do to make the presentation more interesting so it's something that changed the mindset though so all the teachers is going move into the same direction and they face that this is the future so the future we cannot do this uh face to face again so we have to be prepared with the online things <laughs> So that's, that's yeah. Thing. Adding to that, I mean, I'm just curious. In your school, do you have like a, like a PLC, professional learning communities, where teachers come together regularly mm -hmm. to talk about teaching mm -hmm. and talk about student learning and how to go about uh, improving their day-to-day -day teaching? Do you have that in place? As a, yeah. 
yes, we have that in our school. So we usually, uh, you know, gather them with the uh, based on their major. For example, uh, science and then social and then uh, and then art and everything. So they sit down together and then communicate. And they usually have a kind of activity, uh, not only reflection for the teaching learning but it's also some kind of activity based on their major. So this is also happening outside the school. So outside the school, we, we call it MGMP or the community of the teachers of uh, English or Indonesian or everything. So that's what happening outside the school. So in my school, we usually sit down based on the, the major because high school usually we have uh, science and social or language or things like that. Okay, now, can I end by my comment with a question? This is something futuristic, not just for you, actually for every one of us, every one of us, including myself, because I'm still thinking. Uh, once this COVID is over, right, okay, how do you, how, what can we do to sustain this, uh, at this whole momentum you know, of being efficient in what we do and being continually learning as an organization, uh, and this continually changing of mindset. I mean, what, as a school leader, what do you think you can do? Yes, thank you, Dr. Hairan. It's a very interesting. This is something that I really think every, every year before the pandemic situation. So what, what, should, we, what should we do to maintain? Because, because in, in, in our daily, on the field, teachers, are overwhelmed with the assignment, with the administration things, with the responsibility that they have to report uh, to the government, they have to report to this, to that, and everything. So there, there are two schools, right? Private and, and public school. So private school, they have two, if I may say, they, they have two bosses. That means they have to report to the, to the Board of Foundation and they have to report also to the government. So public public school they only go straight to the to the government so in private school we have to do the innovation every year even though we know how to uh, this is not easy because some teachers are overwhelmed overwhelmed just like I said overwhelmed with the tasks and everything so how to maintain in the future is so maybe we could we could actually deliver this because this one is six months I think this kind of habits is going to make them prepare that someday this is the pictures of the futures. This is something that you have to learn. There's no excuse or everything. So uh, m making it run, there will be some, some rejection or obstacles, but I'm pretty sure to make it this happen, we can do it together with the stakeholders to communicate with the foundation, especially because uh, the foundation's board is actually have the authority to make it as a reward or something that's pretty much interesting to me. Thank you for that. Um, I have maybe one or two questions to ask Andy and perhaps Hiron might be willing to jump in as well. Andy, in times of the pandemic that we're facing, or maybe even before the pandemic happened, how do you manage the, uh, the well-being of your stakeholders in the community? How do you manage the well-being of teachers, the students, mm. and parents, and also yourself, right? So, and this becomes much more pronounced during the pandemic when um, there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of uncertainty. So how do you manage the well-being of your stakeholders? This is a question from John Cedric, one of our participants. Okay, thank you, John, for the questions. So, uh, we manage it by communicating. So this is the four skills, right? What we are teaching to the students, the four C's, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and the creativity. So how do we manage? We communicate with the board, the, all, the whole stakeholders in the beginning of the year. So we usually sit down in a different, in a different situation and then uh, we communicate because the principle is in, in the center. So the principle, because in the center, so the principal has to communicate on to the top, to the right, to the left, above and everything. So the key is in the school leader, it's in the principal, how, they, how he or she could communicate uh, what's, 
being the goal. So the vision and mission of the school is become is become something that we have to achieve, that we have to go there at the same time. So, so as, because uh, the stakeholders have different view and different things, so that's why we have to communicate. This is the job of the school leaders, how to make it happen. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, we can elaborate on, on, on that uh, question a lot more as we have the open forum later. But at this moment, I'd like to call on uh, uh, Associate Professor Hiron Sale again. Uh, he has had the opportunity to hear Ronaldo, and he's also had an opportunity to hear Andy. He could also see the questions that have been uh, coming in steadily from our participants. We'd like now to ask uh, Hiron to share with us his uh, thoughts as a critical friend, as, as he looks upon the theme, educational leadership in times of crisis. Hi, Ron. Okay, thank you so much for uh, that. Yeah. Okay, um, I just want to see, share some of my key thoughts uh, after listening from our two uh, panelists. Okay, the first is, like I said, I mentioned this earlier on, it's about technology, innovation, and network. I mean, I think, we are in a digital revolution, right? We are in a digital economy. I would call it digital society also. I don't think we can run away from that or, and, or, or tell ourselves that, yes, we can, we don't have to participate in it. I mean, uh, it's everywhere now. So I think even as educators and even as uh, school leaders uh, or leaders in education itself, I think we, uh, we need to have a good grasp at what are the technological affordances is available to us. Uh, I know that at the end of the day, we still would like to have face-to-face -face kind of uh, learning or in-class learning, teaching and learning. However, I think this is one space where we can really explore much, much further. And uh, the implication is that we really need to be, on, you know, we need to be aware and be consistent, uh, consistently aware what is happening around the world, and especially in the technological space. Uh, if, you, if, you think, if you think about the 5G right now, you think about bandwidth, I think once the 5G is in, I think a lot more, a lot more things can be done uh, in the techno technological space. Uh, the second bit is about innovation. Um, to me, innovation is just not the actual innovation that you, that you, that you have in place. Rather, it's the mindset of innovation. Uh, essentially, we need to ask question, is this the best way to go forward? Are there other alternatives, you know? Uh, and you think about right now, we are moving towards even the creative industries. I mean, if you are in a first world country, uh, first world economy, uh, I don't think we can run away from innovation also. So innovation is just not the actual byproduct that you have, but rather it's more of a mindset. The third one, networks, uh, I think we have seen that in both of these two uh, uh, situations, both two cases. Um, how do we, how would we draw from networks? Uh, I mean, I know that most of us, most of us would be comfortable with working alone, right? Even as school leaders, you're so busy and all that, but you know, this is the fact of life and uh, the more complex the world is, I think the, 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 the greater complexity in terms of networking that we need to have also. We cannot do it alone. That's the thing, because the demands of, uh, that, the demands of you know, uh, preparing our children for the future and the demands of life that's more disruptive, I think requires greater uh, diversity in the, in the networks that we have. Okay, the second, this second slide is really taken more from uh, our, second, our second panelist, uh, Mr. Sophia Andina. And what came to my mind is uh, the importance of communication. I mean, we have always been communicating, uh, right, as, even as school leaders. Uh, but I think in the current crisis, uh, we, have to even, we have to do that even more, in a more coherent way. Uh, but my, what came to my mind is really about, so what is when everything's over? And I think we still need to communicate still, yeah, in a more consistent way. Uh, if you look at the COVID pandemic itself, initially when it all started, right, uh, there was a lot of uh, lack of clarity in terms of how to move forward. 
But can you imagine that when this whole thing is over, we still need to have that kind of clarity in how we want to lead school and how we want our children to, uh, to, to, to prosper and to progress in life through education. Uh, let me give you a like, simple illustration. In, in my research study, I look at how teachers learn in PLCs. One of the greatest challenge is for teachers to come together and agree what they want their students to learn. Sometimes it will take many, many sessions for teachers to just ask themselves, what do we really, or what, what is it that we really uh, want our students to learn? To me, that's the first hurdle. So communication will, will never stop. Yeah, and uh, the bottom circle is about relationships, uh, school leaders, whether it be during, co in, during COVID or during, or even before COVID, I think, I think building a relationship with people, with different stakeholders uh, is still key. Okay, uh, I know this, this, <laughs> this slide, I just, I just want to raise certain uh, key points about the idea of, this is for school leaders, right? I, I think in whatever situation that we are in, uh, the role of school principal as instructional leaders is still important. Whether it is direct or indirect uh, effect, on classroom teaching and learning, uh, that's immaterial. Uh, but, but I think the COVID situation has, has brought on, uh, has given us this opportunity to revisit again, you know, the importance of teaching and learning, because at the end of the day, that's the bread and butter of educators. Uh, however, school principal cannot do it alone. And school principals cannot do it just with the middle, uh, leaders themselves, but they have to work with different, different people. Okay, let's start within the school, right? Uh, the importance of teacher leaders. Um, because the ideas must come from the bottom. The people who have to respond to COVID and at the classroom level are the teachers. And so the teachers need to come together and arrive at the best way forward in terms of providing the right uh, solution to, to the curriculum or to, to, to teaching and learning methods. Uh, but of course, the idea of disparate leaders also means that decisions that are made need to be given to other, need to be made together with other stakeholders. It could be the board of directors, uh, it could be from um, the governors, or, you know, like Dr. Posen himself, you know who play a critical role in providing support to the school. And lastly, I just want to raise about this idea about technological leaders. I'm not saying that there is, uh, the, 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 the idea of technological leaders and disparate leaders, they're not the same, they're not in the same category. What I'm trying to say here is, is it possible that technology could, could shape the way we lead? Uh, that's all, I, I, want, I just want to add, I just want to end with that. Is it part, with a question rather, is it possible that technology eventually will shape how we lead as school leaders? So I would leave that as a question rather than, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, but I'll leave it to you uh, to ponder on and to reflect on. Thank you so much uh, for that. Thank you, Hyron. Um, you have uh, shared with us really intriguing things for us to think about. Um, that last point that you mentioned about the role of technology and how it could actually moderate the way that we lead schools is something that's really very, very intriguing and something that actually is also in my uh, specific research area. And this is really something that a lot of people are looking into, trying to find out what the shape will be. We don't have the answers yet, but I think it's really helpful for you to raise this question. The other point that you really brought up, which for me resonated quite uh, strongly, is, is the idea of the bottom going up approach. Mm. During the pandemic, what's happening is that uh, we have principals, leaders, a lot of our participants now, education leaders, who are doing the management from home. But then you have the teachers who are teaching the students also at home. So in a regular context, the distance, the physical distance is, is actually not that insurmountable because the principal can just go to the classroom and can have a meeting, chat, converse, and take a look at what's happening. 
but now with the with with the situation the distance between the the principal and the teachers has become really more formidable and and that really calls in to all of us to reflect on distributed leadership and you've raised that question right so how much of this can we can we actually uh, allow to to foster how can we promote it or can we learn from these experiences just i thought these were really intriguing points uh Hiron, for you to bring up yeah thank you yeah um at this point what's going to happen is we're going to be inviting all our participants andy and uh, and ronaldo to join us for uh, a panel discussion in the meantime i just wanted to ask our participants to keep on looking at the poll question and respond if you haven't. And I also want to thank the, the questions that we have been receiving. Uh, there were questions about uh, professional development uh, from Bettina, from Melody. And um, I just wanted to say that next week we will have a webinar that really focuses on that, nurturing your staff. And it's something that we could really dwell upon a lot during that, that time. Um, for our open discussion now, one of the questions that was raised is really very interesting from Bara Prasad. And he asked about the autonomy and freedom that school principals have during this time of the pandemic. And I wanted to ask Andy, Ronaldo, and even Hiron, um, when we talk about autonomy and freedom during this time of the pandemic, how, what are the boundaries of this as we engage with the community? Um, how do school leaders, a division superintendent like Ronaldo, how does he delegate, how does he manage autonomy and freedom of the principles that he manages? Um, for Andy, how do you, well, you've already spoken about it, maybe you can elaborate a bit more. How do you balance autonomy, freedom, and accountability uh, with, uh, in, in this time of the pandemic? And perhaps Hiron can also talk about that. Uh, there are also some questions about uh, do we do the students actually learn during the pandemic raised by Justoni, by Sheila? Um, and I, again, we have a third webinar which talks about caring for your students on the 24th of September. But I think the question that I'd like you three to look at and react to is this idea of the autonomy and freedom that school leaders have. Do they actually have this? Maybe we start with uh, Ronaldo because you're the division superintendent, you manage so many principles. How do you balance autonomy with accountability? Yes, thank you. Uh, in my end, as a superintendent, I really give full autonomy to the school principals so that they could think well, they could have their mindset get out of it, and they could lead their people. Because, you know, when a principal is uh, free from fear from us in the office, they are free to do and lead their people. The best in them will come out. And of course, from, the, from our level, we set the direction, we give it to them, then we give them the freedom to do it in their own way because let them do it and the best will come out from them. Thank you, Ronaldo. Andy? Andy, I think you're muted. Yes, thank you, Dr. Vicente. So this is actually something that we are facing it right now, especially in Indonesia, because uh, our Ministry of Education is giving us uh, a freedom to, to develop our school. So this is something new what's happening in this new academic year. So for example, we, uh, we don't have any more the final examination by this year. It's supposed to be next year, but because of the pandemic, so the they uh, we don't have any more the final examination. And then, so the autonomy also giving us the opportunity to develop because the, the, the government is giving us, uh, as long as the students are learning, learning with the, any, kinds of, uh, any kinds of tools. We have Zoom, we have Google Meet, we have, uh, let's say Microsoft also doing it. So, and in a few period, we have to report it also that this is, uh, what we are uh, doing. So the school have the opportunity, I have a chance to make a different call, a different uh, decision. I can Thank you, Andy. Yes, yeah. Hi, Ron. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you raised a good question there about autonomy. Um, but I would like to raise uh, a point about context, you know what I mean? It really depends on the context of where uh, we are in. You know, I know in some countries, I mean, uh, the autonomy is not given so much, you know, and maybe rightly so for cultural reasons, you know. Uh, all I can say is I think in whichever context, there needs to be a balance between that uh, control and autonomy, you know. Um, and if you look at, even if, even if I were to hear from both of them, uh, both of our uh, panelists about you know, given the autonomy to, to really uh, respond to the COVID-19, right? Respond to the demands, all that. I'm sure at the, at the bigger macro level, at a, at a bigger macro level, you do need some kind of uh, broad policy in place, right? So there is consistency throughout. Uh, even likewise, for example, providing resources. So when you provide resources, also there need to be some kind of equity, right? Uh, across the board. Uh, so I think it's a good mixture, you know, between that kind of uh, autonomy together with uh, broad policy that provide the boundaries, you know, to where you can be free to do, to, to respond to what is needed. You know. Thank you, Hairon. So you, you raised a, a very important point about the context and how as leaders, we should be totally aware of that. Andy and Ronaldo, you, you just heard um, before I post this question from one of the members of the audience, uh, the presentation of Hyron in which he spoke about um, technology, he spoke about PLCs, he spoke about engagement, and he spoke about mindsets. Is there anything that you wanted to uh, follow up on Hyron's presentation? Any question? I mean, I asked him about, uh, I commented on how important the two points that he brought up were. But is there something that you wanted to ask uh, specifically uh, from our critical friend? Uh, maybe we can start with uh, uh, Ronaldo, please, if you have something that you would like to, to raise, to clarify, perhaps. Yes, uh, I was struck by his uh, idea that, you know, at a certain level, at a certain level about that autonomy, a boundary setting, and uh, that is really very true. So uh, in case uh, this is not given, well, really, there is really a problem among our schools, especially the principals, because they will never shine. Thank you, Brother Andy. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Andy, Dr. Hirons. I was, uh, I'm very interested in the technology things because some of the school leader uh, are really not engaging with this kind of thing. So when you uh, showing out the slide about the technology and the mindset and everything. So it giving us uh, a mindset that education is, uh, as a school leader, we have to know many things that, because we are the one who is supervising, we are the one who is going to look at it in the field and then report it to, to the board and everything. Uh, thank you. I think that's what I want to say. Let me pose a question instead, right? Uh, kind of a challenging question. We talk about technology, and technology uses, usually requires some kind of uh, electricity. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I saw some of the question and answer, actually. Uh, I comment, you know, you know, what happens if there's no electricity? Uh, okay, I can take it as no electricity because there's no power source to it, maybe, right? Uh, Maybe I can ask Dr. Ronaldo of Posen to, to respond to this. What happened if there's no source of electricity? Yeah, that's a really a uh, problem. If uh, there is no source of electricity, especially in the delivery of learnings now, we have to let our school principal develop their own. Uh, some of our schools now, they are anticipating these things. They have provided their schools through the help of their local government unit, some batteries, uh, some backup uh, source of power. Uh, some are trying to come up with solar. Uh, you know, all these things are coming up from all directions. So that's why I, I really trust our principals with their creativity because I'm telling you, 
they will be the one to be responsible and accountable with all these things with their teachers. They can do a lot of things that I cannot do at my level now. If I may just jump in, that question of Iron is really, because a lot of the other questions talk about, apart from electricity, they, they talk about access. Francis, Satriu, and Adelaide have asked about the question of what about the accessibility of digital tools? Um, what if teachers don't have, what if members of the community, of the teaching community, have limited access to technology? So how, what have your experiences been? Andy, how do you manage this? Is this something that can be solved? I mean, we have participants who may be familiar with remote places. That's what Hiram was referring to earlier. Mm -hmm. How do we address those challenges? We start with Andy, and then Ronaldo, who is, who is uh, in Tarlac with about 10,000 students, can also share with us specific ideas um, that, that, that you can suggest and share with us in relation to overcoming technological challenges that members of the learning community face. Andy, please. Yes, thank you for the question. So this is happening uh, uh, in, in some school in Indonesia. Uh, some of, uh, in some area, they don't have the electricity. So this one is uh, related with the electricity and the technology. If, if some area doesn't have the electricity, they usually make a small group. So I know this is, this is something, there is, there is a risk to do it, but this is small groups, the teachers are coming into, into uh, some, uh, one of the house or students' house, and then they sit down and then, then discuss about it. So it's something very traditional that uh, they are doing in some area in Indonesia. And so what happens if they don't have the, the tools, they don't have the, the things to communicate? So this is something that we are actually uh, never been through that kind of situation because our school is actually middle, in the middle. So most of the students and everyone has uh, the, the gadget, the tools that they're providing it. Yes. Um, before we ask uh, Ronaldo to, to uh, respond to that question, I just wanted to announce the results of the poll. Um, and I think now our friend Jasmine is going to be sharing it with us. Yes. Um, what is the biggest challenge that education leaders and educators face in engaging with the community? As you can see, 54% of, uh, of you who participated mentioned lack of stable internet connectivity, cell signal, and hardware. That's the biggest challenge that, uh, that you encounter. And this is followed by busy stakeholders, parents, teachers, colleagues, community officials, unfamiliarity with technology, 15%, and finally, inconsistent messaging from officials, 12%. So that's, um, that, that is really a reminder of how important and how current this question is. Um, in, in the situation that we all face, technology has risen as a possible solution, but we are encountering issues, really very real issues that uh, hopefully we all can learn from. So we've heard from Andy. Uh, can we hear from uh, Ronaldo? How does he, managing a huge district of schools that are located in city centers and also in remote places, how do you manage that? You mentioned already something about the radio. Perhaps you can elaborate on that. Thanks, Ronaldo. Yes, uh, thank you, Sir Vicente. Uh, you, you see, in this in the area where I am, uh, there are places where there is no connectivity and internet. And the only thing we can do to reach this area is that we were able to come up with the radio station, a school principal was the one who installed it. They, he used his knowledge with a very minimal experiences. Now the whole barangay with uh, more than uh, uh, five high schools and uh, elementary schools could now have their learning modality there within a radius of two kilometers all the students, all the schools, would have a very clear, loud, and nice reception of the things that the teacher will lecture. But again, if there is no electricity, when power comes in, we have our last resort. We have our compendium of learning materials, which we deliver to all the learners. Now, to give uh, security to our, to our students, the parents would get the modules or the compendium of learning materials at a designated uh, 
area, by black point area, and the barangay officials shall take charge in delivering and retrieving all these things. That's where our very strong linkages and networking really comes in because uh, there are a lot of places in my area of responsibility now that do not have uh, this kind of technology, especially the internet connectivity. So that's the last resort we do. We distribute the learning compendium, which were based on the minimum learning competences and the most essential ones, which all could be accessed by students, even if uh, they do not have this uh, technology with them. Thank you, Ronaldo. <laughs> Iron, would you like to mention anything or a follow up on that? No, I just find it very, uh, I think the, the best technology is the human mind. <laughs> <laughs> And human mind and human determination, you know, uh, human creativity. Yeah. So those responses that, uh, particularly what Ronaldo was saying, was that uh, if technology fails, which may happen more frequently in, in more remote regions of perhaps the Philippines and maybe some parts of Indonesia, then they resort to actually delivering the, the learning packets to designated areas and then parents and members of the community pick these up and then use it uh, accordingly. And I think the, the question that, that, that comes uh, naturally after that is, is one that was raised by some of the, our participants. Uh, do, how do we now really know that, that, that they're learning? Uh, how do we engage the community, the parents, uh, particularly in this regard? How can we make sure that the materials that have been delivered to their, to their communities, to in the Philippines, they're called barangays. These are the local, the most basic community. Now, how do we as leaders manage or make sure that uh, learning is actually taking place? Is this something that is almost impossible to do? Or is this something that, that you have taken steps to address? Ronaldo, let's start with you. Yes. Uh, of course, we have to ensure that our learners really learn the most essential competences that they needed to have in every grade level uh, where they are. So we give them some practice exercise, we give them mental calisthenics, and of course at the end of the day, there is that uh, unified examination that the division office will give to all the students to measure how much they really learn. Andy, would you like to jump in to, to that question too? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I think I lost my connection a few yes. a few seconds ago. Right. Yeah. So Andy, it's again, it's one of the realities that we face now that technology yes. sometimes is connection. buffering and connection. So the question we had was, uh, in Ronaldo just talked about what they do when technology fails, just like now it happened, right? So they actually oh, okay. deliver the learning materials to communities. So one thing is delivering the learning materials. Another thing is finding out, do the students, do the learners actually use this? And if they do so, do they use it properly? How do we know that they're learning? How do we engage with the community? I'm talking about the parents here and other members of the community perhaps. How do we engage with the community to make sure that the learning takes place? Is this something that's impossible to do or what have you done in your context? Okay, thank you, Vicente. So this is something that we are actually faced right now. Uh, while everyone, our students have uh, 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 tools, it could be like laptop or cell phone, they could communicate because we are using the Google Classroom and the G Suite for Education. Uh, but somehow, uh, when, when I dig up deeper, deeper to ask the questions and then communicate with you know, on the screen. And then I talk a lot and then do the presentation. And then suddenly they ask, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, what should we do? Okay, did you listen? Uh, I'm sorry, sir, uh, I didn't hear that. I think I lost my connection or anything. But uh, the, uh, later on, in a few months later on, I do some, some, some questions, interview to some of the students and asking them, so how, how do you actually communicate during the, the lesson? And then they, their eyes, I can see their eyes moving around and then their hands. They're, they're just like, we, because we, don't, we cannot see their screen, right? So they actually open up other screen and then they chat their friends and everything. So, so that's what's happening. And then they come up, okay, what, what should we do? Okay, we have to do this. Okay, so they do it. So they complain a lot about the time of learning. 
because we already decreasing the time of learning but however they still think the students still think that this is too much sir this is too much we have to decrease it again so please decrease uh, the assignment the time of learning so so this is the challenge that we're facing so what if this is uh, something that usually happen in the in the public school who doesn't have the tools for for example or some school private school in the low level if they don't have the the tools like a, a laptop or anything they usually use the whatsapp they usually use the whatsapp to actually make a group so they send the papers on so the students have to go to the school to take the paper to take the 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 paper uh, the things that they have to do it. So when they got home, so the report is using the WhatsApp group. So they take pictures. Okay, we're done. Okay, okay, do this page, this one. Okay, they do it. Take pictures again. They done. So it's they don't almost they don't have the communication like us right now because they don't have the 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 platform. They don't have the they don't have the uh, the the laptop or anything. The computers no. They don't. They only have cell phone so that's what's happening here thank you very much andy um the questions are just flowing in now so celia and lizelle uh, this is related to what we're talking about just now uh, engaging with the community and, and making sure that our learners learn now lizelle and celia have a question particularly about parents because the parents are now a, a really important conduit for learning um, what steps have you undertaken uh, as school leaders to engage with the parents? They are not trained as teachers. Um, they're, they're just thrown into the situation like most of us. But what steps, what have you done to try to engage with the parents? Perhaps we talk with Ronaldo first, maybe parents and other stakeholders. And then, we, and then if Hiron has wants to share some points as well, that would be really very welcome. Ronaldo? Yes, thank you. The first thing that we did was to identify all the possible problems that we would encounter. So when we were able to identify these problems coming from the students themselves, from the teachers, from the parents, we had our core group, we, we talked about it, and we presented it to our leaders, to our political leaders, to government uh, organizations, as well as non-government organizations who could possibly help us in coming up with the materials that we needed. So our leaders understand the problem that we are coming in. They would they know and they, are, they know that uh, internet connectivity is a, is, a, is a problem now. So most of our mayors in their own places, in their own municipalities, they installed kiosks wherein uh, it could be used by, by, by students. Uh, they even provided some printers they provided school supplies, office supplies at that, so that uh, in the printing of our learning materials, it would be given free to the poor students, especially those uh, who are uh, underserved, underprivileged, so that there would be no one left in this time of uh, pandemic. That's one, we identified our problems. Number two, we also engage uh, every parent, uh, especially so in uh, coming up with their core group. The parents who were trained or who, were the, uh, who have the hand uh, during our capacity building, they talk among the other parents in their area. You know, when parents talk the way parents do, uh, things will really be different. And if our political leaders also talk among themselves after our group has dispersed, then a lot of things could be done. So it's really a big matter of uh, getting everybody involved and having a, a piece of the pie, especially with the problems and the solutions will really come in. That's why in, in my area of responsibility now, I'm very confident because the governor is uh, spending really a lot of money for the installation of apps so that even if connectivity fails, we will not be uh, paralyzed. Thank you, Ronaldo. Andy, would you like to add your experiences yes. to your answers, responses? Okay, thank you for the questions. So this is actually what happening here. So we we engage with the parents by giving them the information first. So the school giving the information, invite them 
into the forum uh, online or face to face uh, with the with the very strict uh, protocol of help and we inform them what our school going to do what 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 are we going to do for the next six months or one year in this academic year so after that we open uh, a forum so i'm giving them uh, my communication number so our email or because usually parents are asking something to the teachers and teachers doesn't know the answer because this one is related with the policy or decision so i'm giving up my cell phone so they can directly ask me and this is even sometimes i cannot answer directly but i will answer it as soon as possible this is give the parents opportunity to feel oh, okay uh, what what is happen if like this mr andy okay so i answer oh it's going to be like this don't worry everything is uh, being settled down so so the parents feel comfortable and we have a good relation and also we're doing it like uh we're taking uh every every class we're asking them to representative of the classroom so it's like uh, it's like there there's one parents to be a representative for each class so i can actually uh, share some information ask their opinion about what we are going to do and also for the related with the internet stuff like that the government of indonesia is giving up a free credit a free credit of quota for the internet to all students so this is also what the government's doing it so everyone because there's there is a questions right what if they don't have the the the, the tools and they, they have the tools but they don't have money to refill the 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 credit so the government giving up the free credit for every students and teachers in indonesia thank you andy hiron just jump in if you have any additional comments or questions you'd like to raise uh, just um, a, just a comment actually yes uh, <laughs> I think I just want to re-emphasize again that schools cannot do it alone, right? And so we know we need. I think every school will need to draw resources from different stakeholders because the big one is from the government. Yeah. Uh, so, so the the first thing to do is get sufficient uh, funds, okay, sufficient resources to the school, and then after that, within the school, the school need to prioritize. Because we cannot do everything, yeah. So we do need to prioritize and strategize how we want to make use of those resources uh, appropriately. Yeah. Well, thank you, Hiron. So uh, just uh, that's really one of the that idea that Hiron spoke about is this, this was one of the major imperatives that drove us to organize this series of webinars. The pandemic has really surfaced the idea that schooling or the school is not just a building and it can't be done by the principal and the teachers alone. It, it really is a, a community effort. Here in the United Kingdom where I am living, we see that very clearly. Um, the schools need support from members of the local community. We have health workers. We have people who collect the, the garbage, who, people who make the road safe they need to be working together with other members of the community to make sure that the school continues. So really the definition of a school during the pandemic, at least in our context here in the United Kingdom, has expanded. And this is one of the reasons why we're looking at the experiences of practitioners like Andy and, and Ronaldo, and also with the inputs and advice and counsel from Hiron to, in order for us to be able to almost problematize what schooling should be. It's, it's a, it's, it is as if we're saying that perhaps when we take a look at schooling after the pandemic, hopefully uh, we reach that stage, we may need to redefine what schooling is, um, making sure that the community becomes much more involved. Uh, we have, we're almost reaching the end of our Q&A and perhaps one final question which I'd like to address to all three of you panelists. Uh, this is a question that has risen from some of our participants. Some of our stakeholders have been stricken, unfortunately, by COVID. They have fallen ill. What do you do as school leaders to reduce the stigma that these stakeholders, these uh, community members encounter, teachers who are ill, parents who are ill? I would imagine that in some communities, there's a stigma that, that happens. 
how do you manage these? How do you make sure that there's, they still feel part of the community? Maybe we can start with Ronaldo. Yes, uh, uh, that, that question is very timely, certain thing, because you know, last week I was also under uh, self quarantine for two weeks. <laughs> and I don't keep it. I tell to the people that uh, we have to accept it, we have to adapt it, we have to adjust it, but there is always a solution to this. It's not something that we should fear. It's not something that we should discriminate people uh, for the fear of we will be contaminated of what. Because, you know, the government is doing everything it could possibly do to put things under control. And we, the elders, uh, in the bureaucracy, in the schools, in the community, should give that hope to all these uh, uh, people in, in our sphere of responsibility that there will always be solution to this. And let us, uh, together, strengthen our faith that we will rise above these things. If we will have that kind of attitude, people will be uh, contaminated by our, you know, lightheartedness. Let's put things uh, uh, easier rather than make it uh, heavier. If we can do things uh, lighter, why don't we do it? So that's the way I can say as regards this matter, because in our place, in the area where I am working, the cases of COVID is rising, but people do not panic. Once they know that there is a kind of a, we have patient number 35, we all inform everybody that somebody was uh, uh, infected. And you know, the, the kind of empathy that we share instead of uh, ostracizing them, we have it, there is empathy among us. So we always say we pray for them, keep your family safe, do not get out of your home, follow the safety pro uh, protocols that the school and the office uh, is telling you to do it. So it's just a matter of uh, modeling among us positively that all these things will be okay. Thank you, Ronaldo. Adi? Yes. For, for that uh, stigma for the COVID-19, because this one is on the first months of the pandemic, uh, people are so scared. They worry. They're panicking. No one's get out from their houses. And But now after three, four months, uh, where uh, the government's giving up the the some of the solutions, some of the rules, the school also give a different rules, different policy. So on the first on the first step, everybody is working from home. But after the meeting, the the board is asking all the principal from from the lowest level up to high school, and there we sit down together. We cannot do this uh, uh, with it's too long uh, period because uh, the school has to be active. So we make it like 50% coming to school and 50% is not. So on schedule with the health protocol and then with the very strict protocol, so uh, social distancing and everything. So the school is still alive. So people are coming to school, but it's only 50%. So that, that is something that we actually ensure that uh, when when you feel unhealthy with the uh, with the temperature uh, shotgun everything, so you're not allowed to go to school. So every every day we updated uh, the the staff and teacher situation by filling it uh, a form, filling it a form to know that their situation, uh, how is your how is your health going on, and then uh, blah blah blah. There's a there's a there's a link that we ask the teachers to fill in. I think. Thank that's, you, Andy. Thank you. Yes. Hiron, do you have any points? Well, just about, well, I think both of them is allude to the importance of clarity, isn't it? Clarity in uh, the purpose uh, of the current situation, what is our purpose, and clarity in the communication. And once we have that clear, I mean, uh, there won't be any miscommunication or misunderstanding. Thank you. So that uh, wraps our Q&A. Uh, I thank the panelists for sharing with us your insights, Hiron, mm -hmm. Andy, and Ronaldo. I now call on Vignesh thank from you. the Head Foundation to provide us with the closing remarks. Thank you very much, Vicente. And thank you very much to our three panelists for a very enlightening, enjoyable, and inspirational webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, before I close today's webinar, I'd just like to address a few administrative uh, questions that have been raised. 
A number of you have written to us and asked about the issuance of certificates uh, at the conclusion of this webinar. Uh, we at the Head Foundation will be issuing a certificate of participation for those who request and have attended all three webinars. On the last, during the last webinar on the 24th of September, uh, we will be uh, making an announcement about how you could apply uh, for the certificate which we will send over to you. That is one matter. On the other, I think many of you have watched, uh, have been watching this on Facebook Live and we thank you very much. Uh, we do hope that during the next session there'll be enough space uh, in the webinar for you to join us. But if not, we will once again be uh, broadcasting this on Facebook Live. So on that matter, ladies and gentlemen, I would just like to thank our participants and our panelists and our speakers for the enlightening session today. As I shared in the beginning, this is just the first of a three-part series. There are many of you who asked questions about the professional development and the nurturing of educators, teachers, and staff during this pandemic. Next week, we'll be honored to have Professor Alan Walker and a school principal from Indonesia, Diana Vensi, and from the Philippines, we have Domingo, who will be joining us to share their perspective and their views of what they have been doing to ensure the growth, the professional development, and the well-being of the teachers and educators. So do join us next week on the 17th of September. Same time, same channel. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, from the Head Foundation, have a pleasant day ahead. Thank you.